Good evening, friends, and welcome to the 12th annual Dr. Ida Sophia Scudder Humanitarian Oration. We also extend a warm welcome to our alumni, friends, and well-wishers who have joined us online. As we begin today's program, it's my pleasure to invite our dignitaries to the stage, our respected honorary Dr. George Cherian. Our representatives from our partner in USA, Bellow CMC Foundation, Mrs. Deepika Srivatsava, Director of Church Relations, and Ms. Usha J. Sudasan, member of the board. Dr. Dolly Rose, Professor and Head, Department of Transfusion Medicine and Immunohematology at CMC. <laughs> Our Director, Dr. Vikram Matthews. And Vice Principal, Dr. Joy Sarojni Michael. <laughs> Shall we all rise now for the Song of Invocation? And I request that we remain standing during the prayer, which will be led by our chaplain, Reverend Rajesh Charles, followed by the college anthem. Thank you. 
Let's bow our heads and look to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious God, our Heavenly Father, as we gather here for the 12th annual Dr. Ida Sophia Scudder Humanitarian Oration, we come together with grateful hearts to honor the legacy of compassion, service, and healing. We seek your guidance and blessings as we listen to the words of wisdom from our speaker, Dr. George Therian. May his oration inspire us to continue the noble work of serving humanity, just as our aunt, Dr. Ida Sophia Scudder did. Let this even be a reminder of the importance of selfless service and the impact it has on those in need. Bless this gathering with wisdom, understanding, and commitment to make the world a better place. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now invite our director, Dr. Vikram Matthews, to welcome the gathering. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of Christian Medical College, Vellore, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all on this very special event of the 12th Ida Skada Humanitarian Oration which is jointly hosted by CMC Velo and the Velo CMC Foundation in the United States. It is my honor to specially welcome our chief guest, Dr. George Sherian, who has kindly agreed to deliver the oration. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation and gracing this occasion. I request our Vice Principal, Dr. Sir Joyce Sarojni, to honor our chief guest with a ponade. Dr. George Sherian is the Chief Executive Officer and Chief Medical Officer of the American Mission Hospital, Bahrain. American Mission Hospital was established by medical missionaries sponsored by the Reformed Church in America, the same mission that supported Dr. Ida Scudder. Dr. George is a neonatologist with decades of experience working in different parts of the world. 
We also take this opportunity to welcome Dr. George's wife, Dr. Dali, a family physician who has accompanied him on this journey. We are delighted to have with us a host of dignitaries and well-wishers who have honored our invitation to be present here in person or have joined us online. A warm welcome to our friends at the Velo CMC Foundation in the United States who have joined us online. I want to extend a special welcome to Mrs. Deepika Srivastava, Director of Church Relations, Velo CMC Foundation, and Usha Jesudasan, a writer who is associated with CMC for over two decades and a board member of the foundation. I want to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Joy Sarojini, Vice Principal, Dr. Dolly Rose, representing our alumni batches, celebrating their reunions this weekend, and other members of the administrative team, faculty, staff, and students who are present here. I am also happy to note that many of our former directors and alumni have come for this event. It is indeed a proud and joyous moment for us at CMC to celebrate this event where we honor the legacy of Dr. Ida Scudder, our founder. Once again, a warm welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It is my pleasant duty to introduce to you Mrs. Deepika Srivatsava, who is the Director of Church Relations at the Velo CMC Foundation. Her family, the Savari Ryans, are closely associated with CMC, and she was born in our institution. Deepika earned her master's degree in public health from the University of Rochester. Subsequently, she worked in West Africa, Cornell New York Presbyterian Hospital before joining the CMC Velour Foundation in 2013. I now invite Deepika to introduce our partner, the Velour CMC Foundation. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace, 2 Timothy 1.9. On behalf of the Wellor Christian Medical College Foundation in New York City, I extend a joyous welcome to each of you present here and those online who have joined us for the 12th Annual Dr. Ida S. Cutter Humanitarian Oration. We are honored to have Dr. George Cherian, who has graciously accepted our invitation to present the keynote address at today's oration. A special thank you to Dr. Vikram Matthews and the staff and faculty at CMC for hosting this event. Thank you. The mission of the Velour CMC Foundation is to serve and support CMC's purpose of bringing excellence in education, research, and service. By God's grace, the foundation celebrates its milestone 75th anniversary this year. We also continue to celebrate the legacy of our founder, Dr. Ida Sophia Scudder. Ida Scudder responded to God's call. She was sponsored through the Reformed Church in America, and she pursued the healing ministry of Christ through Christian Medical College and Hospital in Vellore, the institution she founded. But Dr. Ida Scudder did not merely leave behind a network of institutions. What she really left behind was a continuous ministry of God's compassion and humanitarian service. A continuous ministry of spiritual and physical well-being of which each of us can be a stakeholder. 
We at the Velour CMC Foundation in New York City are humbled to be stakeholders of this ministry. At the foundation, we are friend raisers and fundraisers. We are ambassadors of God's empowerment and reliable stewards of our donors' charitable funds. In the past five years, the foundation has raised its support to CMC from $0.5 million to $4.5 million, while decreasing our overhead expenses from 29.4 to 9.5%. Since its genesis, the foundation has raised and will soon have placed nearly $70 million into the careful stewardship of CMC. And we praise God for this. It's only through his grace and empowerment. Some of the yearly projects funded through the foundation are tuition scholarships for medical and nursing students. We are currently overseeing 78 scholarships, building sustainable communities through CMC's Jabari Hills Model Villages Program, capital equipment investment to support the programs at the main campus, as well as the new Ranipet and Chittur campuses, and the building of the new pediatric specialty care hospital. At the foundation's 2023 anniversary celebratory gala, we hope to recognize alumni and some individual and institutional members from our faith-based community who have faithfully partnered with the foundation for more than 50 years. Many of these relationships initiated by Aunt Ida herself. The Velour CMC Foundation has supported the Dr. Ida Escada Humanitarian Oration since its inception in 2012, honoring those individuals who have shown Ida Scudder's virtues of compassion, integrity, dedication, and humility. Our prayer and hope is that as institutions and individuals, each of us will, like Ida Scudder, respond to God's call to bring complete wellness for all. Thank you. Thank you, Deepika, for giving us a short account of how you associate with CMC. It's my pleasure now to introduce to you Ms. Usha J. Stasen, who is no stranger to the CMC community. She's a prolific writer, and for many years, she wrote an inspirational piece for CMC every week called Let's Think Together. As an ambassador for the World Council of Churches, Usha has worked with communities all over the world destroyed by injustice and violence. Peace and reconciliation grounds all of her writings. This year, Usha has written a series of articles called College Talk for our students to help them adapt to college life and a changing world. I now invite Ms. Usha Jisdasan to read the citation for the 12th annual Dr. Ida S. Kader humanitarian oration. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor to read out the citation for Dr. George Cherin today. The Christian Medical College Velour and the United States-based Velo CMC Foundation partnered in 2012 to establish the Ida S. Scudder Humanitarian Oration to perpetuate the legacy of Dr. Ida Sophia Scudder by honoring exceptional individuals who exemplify her compassion, integrity, and character. The oration seeks to inspire others 
to emulate her dedication to the service of humanity. Ida Scudder came from a family of medical missionaries who expected her to follow in their footsteps. But Ida did not want to be surrounded by disease and had different ideas. One night at her parents' home in India, three men knocked on their door, one after the other, asking help for their wives in difficult labor. Young Ida, with no medical training, was helpless and turned the men away. Three women and three babies died that night. On hearing this, Ida was so distraught. Through this tragedy, she found her calling. She returned to America to train as a doctor, came back to India, and established a small clinic for women and children. As needs grew, she founded the unique institution reputed worldwide today as Christian Medical College Velo. Ida read these verses from the Bible every day. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes. Love always perseveres. Her example of compassionate care and selflessness in service serves as the inspiration for succeeding generations in CMC. On this, the 12th anniversary of Dr. Ida S. Scudder Humanitarian Oration, we are delighted to honor Dr. George Cherian in recognition of his dedication and faithfulness to God's calling to serve the people of Bahrain. Dr. Cherian serves as the CEO and Chief Medical Officer of the Kingdom of Bahrain's American Mission Hospital. Under Dr. Cherian's leadership, AMH has grown from a small charitable mission hospital to become the largest and most modern, private, nonprofit model hospital in Bahrain. Known globally as a ministry of compassion, it offers affordable, high-quality care, and strives to preserve wellness and health in the community. Dr. Cherian worked in the National Health Service in London before joining Saudi Aramco Medical Services as the lead consultant in neonatology, the largest neonatal ICU in the Middle East. Dr. Cherian's vision has led AMH to integrate into a healthcare ecosystem that links AMH with the Mayo Clinic US and the Sheba Healthcare System Israel to form a unique futuristic healthcare platform that realizes the power of digital health and AI augmentation. On behalf of AMH, Dr. Cherian was awarded the C3 Summit Global Visionary Award in 2018 for his work in missions. He was also awarded the Excellence Award at the 34th Global Organization of People of Indian Origin International Convention in 2023. In recognition of Dr. Cherian's humble dependence on God, his humanitarian resolve, and his pioneering efforts to bring complete wellness for all of humanity, he is eminently worthy of being associated with the name of our beloved founder and is awarded the 2023 Dr. Ida S. Scudder Humanitarian Oration. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. George Cherian. <laughs> May I request the director to present Dr. George with the citation.
Thank you, Ms. Usha J. Stassen. Dr. Dolly Rose is professor and head of CMC's Department of Transfusion Medicine and Immunohematology. Growing up on the college campus as a staff child, Dr. Dolly joined the CMC MBBS batch of 1983. During her service in CMC, she has held important administrative offices, including vice principal, deputy director, and associate director. It's my pleasure now to invite Dr. Dolly to introduce our honoree, Dr. George Shireen. Good evening, friends. Uh, two different institutions, but such similar stories. One, CMC, where we are all gathered today, and the other, the American Mission Hospital, AMH, as it's fondly known, in Bahrain. In 1900, way before oil was discovered in Bahrain, Reverend Zwemer landed on its extremely rocky shores. Responding to his call and the need for health care he saw around, led to the beginnings of the AMH as a tiny dispensary, which today stands tall, providing the highest quality health care, most importantly, at affordable cost. In the life of many institutions come some leaders who make a difference, who turn things around, raise the bar, not just from a competence and technology point of view, but in combination with the core values of accessibility and equity. It is my pleasure to introduce today Dr. George Sherwin, who is one such. Born in Kuwait, despite mathematics being his forte as a child, the examples of his mother and grandfather who were in healthcare inspired him to pursue medicine. After training at the University of Kerala, where he also met his wife, Dr. Dali, who's an amazing support and pillar of strength through this journey of his, they worked in the missions for some time and subsequently moved to the UK where he pursued and specialized in pediatrics and neonatology. He also trained at Sick Kids Toronto. Work took him back to UK, but he soon moved to head an extremely busy neonatal unit in Aramco, and under his leadership, it became the largest neonatal ICU in the Middle East. With a strong passion for quality, he also studied healthcare management at Harvard Business School. In 2009, something changed, and responding to a call that led him to AMH, he decided to, to take over what was then an almost dying mission hospital with the mandate of combining high-end care alongside accessibility to the least privileged, the both and philosophy. With his great combo of insight, sensitivity, and competence, he turned things around. In his words, my mission is to keep people healthy and out of hospital. It's wellness and not illness that should be the focus. And so he created satellite centers, ambulatory services, taking health care to the people, particularly the vulnerable, simultaneously making high-end world-class care available. And today, a health care system equitable to all towers in Bahrain. He has excellent mentoring and leadership skills, evident in the high quality leadership team he has built. With faith, persistence, vision, and hard work, Dr. Cherian has clearly proven that it is possible to bloom where one is planted. It is our privilege today to have you here, sir, and I now request Dr. Cherian to deliver the Dr. Ida S. Kader oration for 2023. Over to you. Thank you all for the very kind words. Uh, and uh, uh, I will just start off by saying that uh, no single person can create an ecosystem, and no single person can in any way create outstanding quality that is God-centric. Uh, it's a team of people, passionate, compassionate people that have to come together to create it. So 
as a disclosure of conflict of interest, I can say that I'm just part of this much, much bigger story that God is trying to weave. So, as technology powers in, dignitaries on the stage, the faculty, alumni, students, colleagues, friends, global missions of the Reformed Church in America who are attending this online. Uh, my colleagues back in Bahrain, a lot of them are watching it in a similar auditorium back in Bahrain. Uh, and for all of the others who have joined online, good evening, and it's good morning in the US. Thank you to the members of the CMC Ida Scudder Oration Committee and the CMC Foundation for inviting me to deliver the 12th Ida Scudder Oration. I truly am humbled and honestly unworthy. But God qualifies the unqualified so that we can dream beyond what we can ever dream. This is a story within a much larger story. This is on a chapel wall. This is on a chapel wall giving tribute to the missionaries that went ahead of us. And uh, this is a, the verse from the Gospel of John. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And it was this death of missionaries that went before us that we here today enjoy the fruits of what they had sown and what we currently harvest. Thank you, CMC, for your hospitality. To my wife and me, over the last three years, you've opened your doors. We have seen the journey you have taken from the past to the present, and we are also pretty much impressed with your new campus that you have now built to position yourself well into the future. I feel particularly thankful and happy today for two reasons. The first reason, 53 years ago, 53 years ago, I was a young teenager being interviewed for an MBBS seat at CMC Velo. I didn't make the cut. So my story had to be formed outside of CMC. The second reason I'm so thankful and happy for is today would have been my mother's 97th birthday. If she was alive, she would be enjoying this oration. Each of us attending here in presence and online uh, have our own stories, amazing stories, a story that, however, connects us to all the CMC. That's why the alumni are here in numbers. And the genesis of a lifetime work of Ida Scudder is being experienced and expressed through our own lives in different parts of the world. Our stories, however insignificant, coalesce to form part of a bigger story. And like the brushstrokes on a painting that is created by a master painter, he creates, God creates this amazing picture, and we are just the brushstrokes that complete the picture in, in its wholesome. As I said, my story was scripted outside of the CMC, and yet I'm here to share some of the similarities in how the seed sown in two different soils, very different soils by the missionaries of the Reformed Church in America, was nurtured by the hand of God to become mission hospitals in two different parts of the world. Five decades, five decades since my first visit to the CMC, much has changed for the better. But many things remain broken globally in healthcare. Systems that are inequitable, inaccessible, and not affordable to large sections of people at the bottom of the pyramid. This picture is the picture of what is it called a Sankofa bird. It's a symbol of a bird that has its head looking backward, however it moves forward, and on its back it carries the most precious thing that is important for this bird, that is its egg. And this is our legacy. This is the legacy of CMC. This is the legacy of AMH. We are steeped in the history 
that goes back 120 years. And it is this legacy that's going to shape our future with the values that guide us through strategies in a fast-changing world that is going to look and feel very different through how you experience CMC during your undergraduate days. Today, we will look at our shared past that brought us to this powerful present and prepare us for a formidable future. This picture, titled The Doctor, hangs in the Tate Gallery in London. It was actually painted by a physician, Luke Files. And on this picture, if you look carefully, you see a dying child. And all that the physician can do is sit in the room of this peasant. The parents are in the background, helpless. And what is strange is you don't notice a doctor's bag or a stethoscope or anything that a doctor usually carries to the home of a patient. And this tells us that this was a, a recall visit for the physician to see this dying child. And all he does is he literally is there in presence with the parents uh, to see the child from life into death. Sadly, much of us face this during the COVID pandemic. Despite everything that we did in intensive care and with all of the technologies that we had, we helplessly stared into multiple patients that actually lost their lives. And the only thing that mattered was we were there. We were there. We were present to overseeing not wellness and you know recovery, but overseeing death. I remind our journeys through the legends that preceded us at multiple levels. You can see that, uh, uh, you know, 2,600, Im Imhotep, the Egyptian, he was a physician of the Egyptian pharaoh, he had already described ways to heal toward the diseases. And then, of course, you've got Socrates or Hippocrates. And then you've got Sestrutka, you've got Jenner, you've got Lenek, who invented the stethoscope, the French guy. And you've got multiple other people there. You've got 1928, Alexander Fleming, Banting and Best, 1922. We realize that it's 100 years since insulin was discovered, and yet diabetes is a global malady. You've got Jonas Salk in 1952, Christian Bernard in 1987, and you could go, I could go on and on and on. But today, it's about two people on the either side of this picture. And they are Ida Sophia Scudder, 1900, and Simon Swimmer. Simon Swimmer wasn't a physician. He was just a clergyman who actually came to the shores of Bahrain. What most people, possibly in this audience, possibly online, do not know is that both these institutions, CMC and AMH, we share a common root that gave genesis to the Christian Medical College Bellow and the American Mission Hospital uh, in Bahrain. The same Reformed Church missionaries that came to uh, South India established the Arkad Mission and missionaries that came to Bahrain that actually established the Arabian Mission. So this was the history of our two organizations. The handprint of God is all over our two institutions. And what I want to do today through this oration is to highlight the common roots, our complementary connections that bring us together. This story of Ida Skara has been told and retold, and we heard it again today. Three knocks, one night that changed the heart of a reluctant young teenager that became the seed on which the genesis of CMC happened. Similarly, two young missionaries in the New Brunswick Theological College in New Jersey uh, underwent a Bible study with one of their professors who was proficient in Arabic. And he sowed the seeds in these two young missionary clergymen to seek the lost son of Abraham in the Middle East. So as uh, Ida Skara was training uh, in Cornell to be a physician, eventually returned back uh, to this part of the world, uh, Samuel Swimmer and James Cantine were these young missionaries that were getting prepared 
uh, to sail into the unknowns of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and they came to the shores of Bahrain in 1893. They set up a small Christian bookshop. And soon they realized that what the people of Bahrain needed was healthcare. There were no physicians, there was no nurses, there was nothing. And soon, right in the marketplace in the capital, Manama, they set up a one-shop clinic that actually took care of patients that literally walked in. But both these were clergymen. They had no medical training. Samuel Swimmer, however, married a nurse, and then she took care of the women patients that actually came there. I will now play a two-minute video clip uh, just to show you uh, the beginnings of the American Mission Hospital. American Mission Hospital, the cornerstone of U.S.-Bahrain relations. Our story starts in Bahrain, a small island with a million palm trees and a big heart. Bahrain started to flourish from 1861 under the leadership of His Royal Highness Sheikh Isa bin Ali Al Khalifa. Around this time in 1888, Professor John G. Lansing from New Brunswick Seminary of the Reformed Church of America, along with a group of his young students, realized they needed to begin pioneer work in Arabia. In the 1890s, the American missionaries, James Canteen, Samuel Zwamer and an Australian missionary, Amy Wilkes, who later became Mrs. Zwamer, arrived in Bahrain. With need of trained resident doctors, Sharon Toms and Marion Wells Toms, a husband and wife team, arrived in Bahrain in 1900, and the Mason Memorial Hospital takes shape. In 1962, the hospital expanded by opening two new buildings in central Manama and renamed itself the American Mission Hospital. The late Amir Sheikh Issa bin Salman Al Khalifa was resolute, however, that this hospital would never close. He had said, it came to serve the people of Bahrain, and it will remain that way. The seeds were sown pretty much the same time Ida Sophia Skara came to Arkert. The big difference was the science of Arabia was much more hostile and harsh for the seeds to bloom. As you saw in the video, the Emir of Bahrain provided land to Samuel Swimmer after a lot of uh, difficulties uh, by 1900. And with the monies donated by a family in New York, named the Mason family, nothing to do with Masons, but the family was called the Mason family, work began on building a new hospital uh, in Bahrain. The, and uh, 1900 was the year that Ida Skara came to Arcot, and 1900 was the time the two young missionaries from the University of Michigan decided to give their heart to God and come to Arabia. And they were this couple, Sharon Thoms and Marion Wells Thoms, and the new hospital was opened on the 26th of January, 1903. This had about 30 beds. This new hospital was dedicated to God and Arabia. Uh, and this was the first and only hospital in the Middle East at that time. By 1904, this is virtually 18 months after the opening of this hospital, Marion Wells Thoms, the lady physician, she and her two children died of cholera. The following year, Samuel Swimmer's two children died of malaria. And they're all buried in the Christian cemetery next to our hospital. The Bahrain Station of the Reformed Church in America also established the first church in Bahrain which is today called the National Evangelical Church of Bahrain, and a school, which was initially called the Mission School and subsequently named the Al Raja School. Both these institutions are still fully functional today. Their sacrifices were great, very great, with the loss of life, with very little comforts and benefits. 
that we take for granted today. The oppressive heat and humidity, if you think that Velour is humid today, think about 46 degrees Celsius and 90% humidity. There was no electricity in Bahrain until 1930. So the only way you could keep cool was doing this. In fact, people were hired to come into the wards to fan to keep patients cool when they had a temperature. It was a huge challenge because there were marshy swamps in Bahrain. Most people think that Bahrain is a desert country. There were marshy swamps because there are underwater springs uh, and mosquitoes and everything else that went with it flourished in Bahrain. And the very illnesses that took the lives of people in Bahrain also took the lives of missionaries who worked there. In 1926, the first women and children's hospital in the Middle East was built and opened at AMH, and it was called the Marion Wells Thorms Women and Children's Hospital. Our OBGYN clinic still runs out of this clinic. And I can see Dr. Leela John in the audience today, and she must have done very many clinics uh, in this particular building. The missionaries, though, the big difference between here and Arcot and Arabia was that uh, there was focused concentration of what was happening in Arcot, but the missionaries had to travel to other parts of the GCC for healthcare to get there because people just couldn't travel on camel caravans and get to the hospital in Bahrain. So what they did was they traveled out in camel caravans uh, to treat the tribesmen in very many different places from Kuwait to UAE all the way down to Muscat. And one of the job descriptions that a chief medical officer had to have, and I have it with me, is that they have to learn to read and write Arabic and have to learn to ride a camel, because that was the only mode of transport. So this is how it started. And what they did was they established mission hospitals called AMH, American Mission Hospital. They established a hospital in Kuwait, one in UAE, and another one in Muscat. And the mother hospital was, of course, the hospital in Bahrain. Sadly, with the discovery of oil and the region becoming affluent, there no longer was the need for charitable mission hospitals. So as soon as the region became affluent, new hospitals came, people wanted better facilities, and they moved into these new government hospitals and private hospitals. And like mission hospitals all across the world, soon they ran into trouble for lack of financing, lack of resources and manpower. And the hospital in Kuwait closed. It is a museum now. And the one in Muscat is an interfaith center. The only hospital that still functions uh, is the American Mission Hospital uh, in uh, Bahrain. In 1940, this is how the arc of God's hand comes upon. In 1940, a young Indian physician came across from Saudi Arabia where he had worked for a year in an oil company hospital. And it's on his way back, back to India, he stopped over in Bahrain because the Second World War had broken out and there was disruption of shipping. And he then walked in to the American Mission Hospital. The chief medical officer of the American Mission Hospital then was Dr. Paul Harrison, a name that all of you are familiar with, who was a graduate of Johns Hopkins, who came across to Bahrain as a missionary to Arabia in 1909. And he decided to give his life as a missionary just because he heard Samuel Zwemer preach about the mission work in Bahrain. So he gave up his future and traveled to you know, Bahrain in 1909. And when this young Indian physician walked in, Paul Harrison was the missionary chief medical officer there. This young physician was none other than the late Jacob Chandy. I've got his son, Matthew Chandy, sitting in the audience here. And so there began a relationship between Dr. Jacob Chandy and Paul Harrison. Paul Harrison became his mentor, confidant, and friend. And I will now show you a brief clip of Jacob Chandy talking about the American Mission Hospital in Bahrain. 
it will be very interesting to know your experience with uh, Dr. Paul Harrison and our in Mission Hospital. Paul Harrison considered me as his son. He and his wife, Anne, took me to stay with them. And uh, he was a, such a disciplined man that I was also under that discipline. He encouraged me, taught me, uh, guided me, and he was my mentor. Uh, the mission hospital, we did surgery, we did everything. And that was how I have. And there again, since he was involved with uh, uh, neurosurgical procedures with Harvey Cushing, he had an inclination uh, uh, with the neurosurgical procedures, and he encouraged me to go into neurosurgery from then onwards. He wanted me to go for postgraduate work, and that is how my life uh, planning was uh, finished. Meanwhile, you must have got married. Yes, yes, of course. My father made all the arrangements. It is the traditional pattern of arranged marriage. And they have arranged everything and called me to uh, call me home for the marriage. My wife's name was Thangam, and she was a graduate of the Madras University. We uh, li visited our parents for a little while, uh, two weeks, and came back to Bahrain, where uh, Harrison's met us at the airport and took us to their home. We stayed there for a month. And then we had moved to our own house. There we uh, had our son, Matthew, was born there. And uh, there was a separate women's hospital also attached to this that was managed by both Harrison, that meant I was also involved to some extent, and another American lady doctor. Dr. Matthew, this is a tribute to your dad. Uh, and uh, this, again, one part of the puzzle, or the bigger puzzle that God had created in how the various pieces came together where two different mission hospitals in two different parts of the world got connected. And you have to understand, it was Paul Harrison who ultimately helped Dr. Jacob Chandy to set up the neurosciences and the Neurosurgical Institute in this hospital, and you guys have got the privilege of being called, you know, the, the, the center of excellence of neurosurgery, the father of modern neurosurgery, and so on and so forth. But it all happened under the hands of another missionary physician called Paul Harrison uh, in Bahrain. Today, the Paul Harrison Award is one of the most prestigious awards instituted in 1966 by the CMC and the Alumni Association annually to one or rarely two uh, undergraduate or postgraduate alumni for selfless long-time service for the community so that you will be able to uphold your motto of the institution not to be ministered unto but to serve. This is in memory of Dr. Paul Harrison, the missionary to Arabia. We also have in our midst today an alumni of the CMC 1958 batch, 1958 batch, Dr. Leela John. Dr. Leela John served at the American Mission Hospital for 20 years as an OBGYN consultant and has delivered 1,000 babies, over 1,000 babies, including royal babies. So I am so humbled to actually meet her. We, we, we met for the first time, even though she lives in Cochin. Uh, we met here for the first time yesterday, and I knew that she was going to be here. So thank you, Dr. Leela, for all you have done through your illustrious career. And the good thing about Dr. Leela John is she's never worked in any other hospital other than a mission hospital, and she's been very fortunate with that. And there are other people. And by the way, people in Bahrain still ask for you. Where is Dr. Leela John? You know, so I, I can go back. And, I'm, and I promise that I will take a picture with you and take it back with me to show that Leela John is here. Uh, Swami, Swami Egan, I, I mean, I'm Priscilla. Priscilla is somewhere here in the audience. There she is. Her father 
and mother worked at the American Mission Hospital from 1956 to 1986, 30 years. We then have Dr. Susan Isaac, uh, the batch of 1966. She has worked there for 42 long years, a whole career from CMC. She came to AMH and worked for 42 years, and she recently retired at the age of 72. And I could go on and on with the stories that connect CMC to where we are in Bahrain. Professor Nihal Thomas is somewhere in the audience here. There he is. And I, I told him I'm going to mention his name. His father worked at the American Mission Hospital in Bahrain, and three of his siblings were born there. Unfortunately, Nihal was born in, in Bangalore. <laughs> okay, three of his siblings were born there. Growth of our institutions took on two different trajectories, completely two different trajectories. CMC growing to what it is today, a leading academic medical center in India, population and the need for medical care propelled CMC to where it is today. However, the mission and vision of our two organizations coalesced around the healing ministry of Christ. And this is the capstone on which the foundation of both our hospitals stand on. This is the, the mission of AMH on one side, and this is your vision on the other side. And for us, everything that we do rests on the biblical principles of compassion, grace, and love. And everything that you do is done through the healing ministry of Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. This now brings me to my story. I said all of us have a story, and this is my story in brief. My story with an AMH is not a quirk or an accident or a coincidence. I was actually born at the American Mission Hospital in Kuwait, which was established by Paul Harrison in 1912. Little did I know that 50 years later, God would bring me to the American Mission Hospital in Bahrain to serve as its 12th Chief Medical Officer. 53 years after we first coming here, little did I know that God would bring me to CMC to give the 12th Ayraskara oration to you, which I'm doing today. It is not a coincidence. And my parents, they had a very unconventional Kerala marriage. They met in Kuwait. My mom was a nurse, initially had worked uh, uh, in the American Mission Hospital, and my dad worked for the oil company there. They met there. They got married there. Can you believe it? In those days, they did not come back to Kerala for the wedding. They got married there. Uh, I was born and baptized in the first church there. And little did I realize that even though when I went through my schooling and met school days and all of that, but God would actually hold me and pull me back into missions at the American Mission Hospital in the very same region that I was born. I met my wife in med school. And we wanted to go into missions straight after graduation. And we did in Kerala for a short while before I headed out to London for my postgraduate studies in pediatrics and neonatology. What was meant to be a few years turned out to be many, which took me to Toronto and back as a consultant in London. And like all consultants in the NHS, after four or five years of being a consultant, you're given a sabbatical year. And this sabbatical year challenged me, and it took me to Saudi Aramco. It was an American hospital, uh, and uh, I went there just for a year. This one year sabbatical turned out to be 18 years. It turned out to be 18 years. Uh, Jacob Chandy's sabbatical just lasted for a year, and he came back to CMC. My journey was slightly, you know, like how the Israelites went all over. But it was here in Saudi Aramco, while serving there, that God came into my life, or our lives. And it was through a Bible study with a dear friend of mine and mentor, who now serves on the board of the American Mission Hospital. He's watching this online. We had our hearts rekindled to leave the comforts of 
Saudi Aramco and to go back into missions, we were not sure where. We just prayed. One busy afternoon in the neonatal intensive care unit, I had just returned uh, from transporting a sick ventilated baby with diaphragmatic hernia from one of our peripheral units about three hours away. So I just brought in the baby and the nurses were stabilizing the baby in the NICU and I was sitting in my office and writing the orders for this baby and there was a knock on my door. This is not a three knock story, this is a one knock story. Uh, there was a knock on my door and I expected the nurse coming in to get the, 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 the orders. But actually when I opened the door, it was one of my Bible study friends who was a primary care physician that worked with my wife. His name was Dr. Mark Reimer. And I said, Mark, what are you doing here? He said, have you got five minutes? I said, sure, come in for five minutes. He sat down and the story unfolds. Mark Reimer comes from a line of missionaries connected to the Scudders. So he was a family doctor working uh, with us, my wife's colleague in Saudi Aramco. And he was called to take up the position of the chief medical officer of the American Mission Hospital in Bahrain. So the job was offered to him. Uh, and then he said, look here, I'm not just in any way, shape, cut out to take on this job. But he said, I think I know a guy who might be able to do it. And he comes into my office and says, George, we have prayed together. You wanted to go into mission, we have done this praying together. And now here's the opportunity. Long story short, all I can tell you is faith journeys are never straight lines. There's no A to B. I had many doubts, many doubts in my capability to step up to this task. We try very hard to connect the dots and then realize later that we are the dot, and it's God that connects the dots. It's the handiwork of God that actually calls us in places, in places like on a chessboard, and he moves the pieces. He moves the pieces. Many of you sitting here and watching this online are trying to connect the dots of your own lives. And I repeat, you are trying to connect the dots of your own lives. Sit back and allow God to do it. The outcomes are much better. After 25 years of working in what I would call in an adrenaline-fueled life of being a neonatologist, you know, sick babies, ventilators, and all of this, I was asked to take on the position of a chief medical officer that did not have an EQ. I argued with God, God, you have given me all the talent, you've sent me all over the world, you've trained me as a neonatologist, uh, I've been doing this, I've been doing that, you want me to go and then be a neonatologist in a hospital that did not have a NICU? The answer was yes, I had to. So, as soon as I said yes to uh, the calling, I had so many trials and temptations that came in my way to stop me from taking up the position. Better job offers, better positions, all kinds of things came up my way that would stop me from taking up the position of the American Mission Hospital. But uh, fortunately, when my faith was weak, my wife's faith was very strong. She said, nope, you are to go. And I'm not going to talk about our powerful present. This is the journey that all of us had to take. And it's no coincidence that I'm standing here talking to you, delivering the 12th Ida Scudder oration. For all the challenges I faced in taking over the running of a, a mission hospital, the only comfort I had was the comfort in the I am who called me to take on this job. AMH, like CMC, had faced several turbulent times in its history as early as 1904, the hospital was threatened for closure because there was an outbreak of smallpox in Bahrain. And the rumor was that the missionaries had poisoned the wells and the people were dying of smallpox. And like the other mission hospitals in Kuwait and Muscat, uh, as soon as oil became available and the region became affluent, 
no longer people wanted to go to a mission hospital. They'd rather go to these big, fancy private hospitals or government hospitals. So, and Bahrain is a small country. Bahrain's population is 1.5 million. I think it's the population of Bello. Uh, and here, we struggled to stay above water. However, the ruling family of Bahrain supported the hospital and did not want the hospital closed due to the service we had rendered to the people of Bahrain for over 100 years. And over the last 10 years, the hospital has progressed. From a small mission hospital, we built three ambulatory care facilities. So in a small country like Bahrain, we were on four sites. And the challenge still remained that unless we had a completely new campus where we could provide proper secondary tertiary care, we could not create an ecosystem uh, as a mission hospital. We had no land and we had no money. Nobody, no foundations funded us for the American Mission Hospital. It's a completely not-for-profit hospital and we are sustained by our operations. So, it was just faith in how we proceeded. God, in his infinite wisdom, provided me with a meeting with the King of Bahrain, to whom I proposed building a world-class smart hospital that would bring the best of medical care to Bahrain. And you all know the proverb, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. AMH was given the land and the money was made available by the beginning of 2020 with a clear instruction to me that there should be no philanthropic support from outside of Bahrain. And this money was going to come from within Bahrain to build your new hospital. We were ready to start construction of the hospital in September 2020 when the world was dying with COVID. Construction started, but many people warned me, do not go ahead with the project. This is foolishness at a, a high level. The project timing was bad, very bad. However, time and purpose is in the hands of God, not in the hands of man. We went through building of this new hospital. The COVID pandemic and its fallout highlighted the disparities in how the management uh, of the pandemic and the race for COVID vaccine played out globally at a global stage. CMC, you did well. And I gather that you had only one or two people that died uh, from your staff. However, in Bahrain, Bahrain, UAE, and Israel were the three countries that managed COVID very well. We were the la top three of 170 countries that managed COVID. And we managed it because the population was small. Uh, multiple vaccines were available very early for the population, and there was intensive screening. So our patients were managed very well. However, having said that, the first physician to die in Bahrain was from our hospital. He was a missionary doctor who had served in Saudi Arabia, left Saudi Arabia because of persecution, came to AMH, and his predominant task was to look after laborers that came into our hospital. Contrary to what most people think, Bahrain is not a rich country. There are a lot of poor Bahrainis and there are a lot of expats that don't have access to good quality health care. So Dr. Solomon was his physician who looked after all the laborers who came here. He unfortunately caught COVID and he died. Standing with his widow and his son by the graveside in the Christian cemetery in Bahrain, we saw the grave digger who dug his grave come to us and in Hindi said, this doctor was my doctor. So the grave digger's physician was a doctor that was buried there. And so the challenges were many for us. That brings us to our shared powerful present. Even though building through COVID was challenging for us, what we did was we used COVID to sort of look at what design changes could we make in the new hospital that we are building that will prepare us for the next pandemic. And what we did is, as the buildings progressed, 
we made the design changes based on information that was coming out of CDC, on all of the things. And now if you come into a new hospital, every triage room, every triage room is negative pressure on all the floors in all the clinics, and there is an isolation room pretty much in every outpatient clinic in every corner. So if there is another pandemic, we know how to sort of separate our possibly infected patients from non-infected patients. All our elevators, all our elevators are touchless. You don't have to touch the elevator, you just need a point, it'll light up. All our food and beverages, everything that moves in our hospital is moved on auto-guided vehicles, on robots. No one pushes a food cart, uh, uh, a laundry cart, uh, nothing. These are automatically loaded onto auto-guided vehicles that run from the basement to all of the floors of the hospital. Fully automated. And these auto-guided vehicles will even talk Wi-Fi to service elevators. No one has to call the service elevator for the robot. It'll call it, it'll come and wait, we'll take and deliver it. We could install all of this because we realize that the future, uh, we are not going to be prepared for the next pandemic that hits us. Sophisticated building management system monitor pretty much everything in our hospital. From ventilation to air quality to you name it, we can monitor it. And I've seen some of it in Ranipet, uh, you know, building management systems. Our solar panels provide 30% of all our energy. Uh, and in the middle of the desert, Ali means mountain in Arabic. This is where our new hospital is located. So we were digging and we wanted to put 500 cars underground. Rather than build an ugly car park on the top, we said we would put 500 cars. And while we were digging in the basement, we struck water, not oil, we struck water. And that too, fresh water that you could drink. And these were from deep underground water springs that actually are present in Bahrain in some you know, parts of Bahrain. And I call it the Jacob's Well, for it produces water through an RO plant for all our irrigation needs for which we don't pay one rupee. It is free for us. Believe it or not, exactly in two years and three months, we completed building the hospital. Exactly two years and three months. It has 125 single bed suites that can be expanded to 200. And you will ask me, how come you should have built a 500 bedded hospital? The era of large hospitals is of the past. Tomorrow's healthcare is going to move into the home and into the community. Inpatient beds are only going to be for those complicated surgeries. Knee replacements today are day surgical cases. Knee replacements, hip replacements are day surgery. So in the next two to three years, uh, many of the monoliths that are 2,000, 3,000 bedded hospitals uh, will stay empty without lights and without nurses. So we have to look at a completely new model of delivering care all over the world. This is not just a Bahrain phenomenon or a CMC phenomenon, but this is gonna be a phenomenon globally. This is how a new hospital looks, an aerial shot of the hospital. This is how it looks. It's shaped like an X chromosome, and the reason why I chose an X chromosome is females always are stronger and survive longer. And I know this as a neonatologist. So one X arc is the women and children's block, and the other arc, the X, is the uh, surgical and medical block. You have the chapel right in the middle there. The small building that you see there is the chapel. Uh, and on the other side is our emergency room. Uh, there is a garden there. And the block that you see at this end is a completely self-contained apartment complex for our staff, predominantly for our nurses and technical staff who have to be close to the hospital at all times. And I will show you a, a brief video clip of the opening of this new hospital by none other than the Crown Prince and the Prime Minister of Bahrain. This is just to show that they are actively involved uh, in supporting us at every level. The hospital was opened on the 26th of January, 2023, 120 years to the day, to the day that the first hospital was opened in 1903. Enjoy this one minute video clip.
he's going to be the next king of Bahrain. He's the crown prince of the prime minister, the son of the present king uh, of Bahrain. This brings me to the third part of my address this evening in how the role of mission hospitals would evolve to play a role in the future of health at a local level and at a global level in creating impact and influence. AMH, as I said before, does not receive any subsidies or grants from anywhere outside, and we are completely self-sufficient through our operations. Impact without influence and influence without impact will not shape the changes that need to occur at both ends of the pyramid that make this future a reality for us going into the future. Our shared history, CMC, American Mission Hospital, into this future uh, is going to look very different, very different from the journeys that we have traveled on in the last 100 years, in the last 100 years. And yet, all I can say is neither Ida Sophia Scudder or Samuel Swama could have ever dreamt what we are experiencing today through CMC and through the American Mission Hospital. The Reformed Church in America, the leadership of our organizations, and the worldwide alumni would all continue to play an active role in shaping the future of how CMC and how AMH would actually go. Contrary to the belief that mission hospitals have outlived our purpose and existence, I believe the mission hospitals have the greatest opportunity to shape the future of healthcare through a non-profit uh, non model of delivering healthcare. Change could be disruptive like a tsunami, or it could be a tidal wave that comes and crashes onto the shore, or it could be a ripple that can just spread out to touch all of the shores through compassion, love, and grace. Our new hospital, new hospital is called the King Hamid American Mission Hospital because of the generosity of the king that provided us with the land and money to build this amazing facility. This is a teaching hospital for the students uh, of the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland, which is a 300-year-old institution, but has got a branch in Bahrain. So their students rotate, nursing and medical students rotate through us. In addition to this, we have collaborated partnerships with Mayo Clinics in Rochester, with the Shiva Medical Center in Israel, the world's largest not-for-profit organization with clinical research and training excellence in medicine. Mayo provides us with governance, academic medical streams, and quality as part of creating a nodal hub of excellence in the GCC. Shiva creates a phenomenon called ARC. ARC stands for uh, Accelerate, Redefine, and Collaborate. ARC is a center where the future of health is going to be shaped through technology. And there are five ARC centers created all around the world to transform digital health. One is in Chicago. The only one in the US is Chicago, Illinois. They're building up a new one in New Jersey. There's one in Ottawa, Canada, one in London, England, one in Melbourne, Victoria. Of course, the hub is Israel. And the newest one is Manama in Bahrain. This is our new hospital. And what do these hubs do? These hubs, you know, it, it does a lot of stuff, but I've just given the headings there. It is focused on precision medicine, extended VR for simulation training, generative AI for predictive analytics, image recognition, and creating smart medical devices. Their only focus is this, because they know, like some other IT companies, that this is going to be the change that's going to happen fall upon us in healthcare. And who are the people leading it? Who are the brains behind it? There is a group called the Future of Health, or FOH. And uh, this is a, a community of global leaders of premier healthcare organizations, academics and policymakers, and patient adver advocacy groups from all around the world that is shaping global healthcare for 2050. AMH is one of the institutions there. We are the David among the Goliaths of healthcare in this FOH group. And for me, 
nothing that FOH does would be practical if what they come out with is not made accessible and affordable and equitable to the people at the bottom of the pyramid. So all of the 80 people who are on this have committed to making sure whatever is created, a platform of healthcare that has been created, is going to be affordable to everywhere, every part of the world. ESG is part of a forward-looking strategy. We, and I mean because I just saw the Ranipet campus, we cannot ignore the impact we have on the environment through high energy use in healthcare, through air conditioning, air purifier system, and cooling required for our data systems. Medical waste and the use of plastics require careful re-engineering so that we don't contribute to the climate change and the pollution that exists all around us. 30% of our energy, and I know it's about 10% of your energy, is sourced through solar power. All our groundwater is recycled. The glass you saw on the facade of our building is a special glass that absorbs heat so that the cooling systems uh, won't have to sort of generate too much power. In addition to all of this, the, our community outreach is not reaching out to the patients that require care, but it also reaches out to the community where we exist to provide job opportunities. In fact, at AMH, we have 15 different nationalities that work in our hospitals, and the, our board of directors are based in the US. Uh, the members of our executive management team, which includes me, comes from UK, Malawi, South Africa, and India. So there's complete diversity uh, in how we run it. And finally, not to bore the young people in the audience, I put in something for you. This is the future of health. Now, my definition of young people are any practitioner here who is not going to retire from practicing medicine in the next five years. If you're not going to retire practicing medicine in the next five years, this is important for you, okay? You are going to shape experience and live through this next revolution in redefining the future of health. You have no idea on how it is going to come upon you. The beginning of this revolution started in 1990 when a guy called Bernard Lee, if I ask you who Bernard Lee is, some of you, I, I see Joel shaking his head there, uh, you might not know who he is, but anyway, he, using a Steve Jobs old Next computer, developed the key technologies that developed WWW, the web. Okay? The hypertext markup language, HTML, the hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, and the URLs, the uniform resource locators, were all created by him. And it was in August uh, of, I think it was 1991, that the first web was launched in the world, 1991. The rest is history. And I'll give you an interesting trivia, just to keep you awake. Berners-Lee, Steve Jobs, and Bill Gates were all born in 1955. So if anyone of you were born in 1955, that's a good year to be born. It is just a trivia. The beginning of the web did not stop our inaction when COVID descended on us. We think that with a click of a button, I can Google up and look up anything. And yet, when the COVID pandemic was unfolding in Wuhan, China, uh, and, and hundreds of people started dying, you know, the internet or the web did not wake us up to see what was happening. So in future, we will have to have better alarm systems or surveillance systems that will alert us of how the world is going to respond to another pandemic. And by the way, the bad news is the next pandemic, we don't have to wait for 100 years. It's going to be around in 25 to 40. So it possibly will happen in some of your life cycle, not in my life cycle, but in some of your life cycles for the young people here in the audience. So the future of health, uh, five key areas are going to change. Five key areas are going to change. That is going to shape your future, maybe not my future, you know, because uh, I certainly don't think I'll be around to see all of these changes. Uh, and the five changes that's going to happen is data sharing. Your data that you create each and every day is going to be shared uh, through, of course, you know, uh, safety and cybersecurity and all of that. And it is your data that becomes your capital. Instead of money, data will become your capital on which you will research, plan your services, 
improve your operational systems, and everything will be based or not on somebody else's data from Mayo, but your data. Interoperability of your data, whether it is imaging, numbers, whatever it is, this is going to be a seamless transaction of the you know, movement of data all across. And I know that your chips, uh, you can store uh, you know, CT scans and images from gastroenterology and surgery and all of that can be stored and then you know, call back. Equitable access will have to be a part of this, the rich and the poor. And by the way, consumers are going to demand things. They no longer are going to say, you know what, uh, dirty consult rooms and uh, privacy is not provided, that's okay. Maybe that was okay in Velo 10 years ago, but 10 years from now, that's going to be unacceptable. So there's going to be an exponential change in how the behavior of our patients are going to demand things from us and we have to be prepared to make these changes. In the midst of this exponential change, the question I have for all in the audience and for those online is, how are you, not how are we, how are you going to respond to this inequity, inaccessibility, and affordability? It's not somebody else's problem. It is our problem. The suffering we endure to achieve longevity is unacceptable and unnecessary. We have manage to prolong life, but not the portion of life that we live in good health. You can live up to 90, but a great proportion of the 90 years is lived in ill health. Mental, social, and spiritual health are as important as physical health. Most of our research and data and analytics and all of this is geared to physical health. Checkbox, you know, you're healthy, not healthy, you know, and that's it. But no one looks at your mental health, emotional health, and spiritual health. And it is in this mental, physical, and spiritual health is buried all the determinants of your physical health. I mean, you thought by now we as physicians would figure that out. But trust me, we still haven't figured it out. The social determinants of health remain hidden. And if unattended to, the promises of better health for the future could be overstated and remain unachievable. We, meaning you and I, will have to build influence at the top of the pyramid so that what happens at the top of the pyramid can be accessible in an affordable way to the people at the bottom of the pyramid. Health in its most simple form is about our ability to function normally within the context of our environment and community, not like how we like to live in the US or Canada or uh, Kerala. I mean, the people of Vello will have to contextualize us how they want to live. And it's not about just disease and death. It's about how they live comfortably within the environment that they find themselves in. By 2040, 2040 is just a few years away, healthcare as we know it will no longer exist. The barriers of hospital walls in how you provide care, siloed care, will be a thing of the past. There is going to be a fundamental shift from healthcare to health and wellness. Health is the greatest of human blessings. Not my statement. Statement, none other than Hippocrates, 440 BC. He stated this. Health is the greatest of human blessings. You will only realize that health is a blessing once we lose our health. Till the moment you lose your health, everything is well. But the moment you lose your health, health is the biggest blessing. And while disease can never be fully eliminated, through science, data, and technology, we can actually diagnose it early and make changes early so that uh, we will never catch cancers once it's metastasized, but we catch it early because we've screened and caught it early, and where treatment is cheaper, uh, and uh, uh, it'll really improve the quality of life. Mission hospitals like CMC and AMH to stay ahead of the curve of this thing that is descending on us will have to think very differently very differently. And there are two broad domains that we, we will have to think to stay ahead of the game, like the Mayos and the Shebas and all of this. One is to look at your own data and create platforms that can analyze your data and tell you what exactly is happening in your populations, in your hospitals, and how you can actually further improve care using your own data rather than mining data from some other country that is irrelevant here. And the backbone of tomorrow's healthcare truly is 
AI, generative AI, and all of the other things that are added with the quantum computing, and so many things will come to our aid to help us to deliver better healthcare. And everything else that we plan has to be built off these systems. I go to large hospitals and ask them to see their IT platforms. The IT platforms are not ready for anything that's going to happen in the next three years. Next three years, forget five years. Next three years, you're not ready. And if your IT systems are not ready, and if you don't invest in IT system, this is a plug-in for Ebenezer, okay, for IT. Chips, if chips have to be really AI and augmented AI, then there needs to be a lot of investment that actually goes in there. You've heard of Google Bard, Microsoft's Bing, and other content-creating platforms. They're competing in the highly lucrative healthcare market. Trillions of dollars. This is the money at stake. Google has introduced MedPalm 2, which is being tried out as we speak in Mayo. One of the biggest pain points in healthcare, for those physicians who practice healthcare, know that one of the biggest pain points is medical records, electronic medical records. How do you enter patient data into medical records? You've got only 10 minutes with the patient, and yet you need to do it quickly. So Amazon, just last week, last week came out with a tool called the HealthScribe. This is a combination of voice recognition technology and augmented AI that can create summaries of notes that you can easily imprint into your electronic healthcare records. You don't have to sit and type for 15 minutes. Okay, so these things are going to change the way we are going to practice and look at healthcare. The second big domain, the second big domain that will influence the future is well-being and care delivery, and those models are going to change. There is a big danger in digitized medicine, and this is that technology is selectively targeting physical health and not mental health, spiritual health, and any of the other domains, because that's not money-making. Anything that is screening more procedures brings in money. Mental health, uh, spiritual health, it's not a money-making exercise. Noble intentions that we have can become idols in our life, in different settings publications and research in academic medical centers that add no value. Profits that for-profit seek has got no value if it doesn't touch the poor people. And the pharma companies creating these massive amounts of medicines that the poor countries or poor people can't access. And finally, teaching, training, trials, and research of the future that you guys will be involved in is going to be on open platforms. And technology is going to be the lever by which a lot of your publications are going to come. Patient choice with compassion in the heart has to be the route that you and I will have to take to maintain the mission, the main mission, always the main mission. No institution, whether it is CMC, AMH, Sheba, Mayo, no institution, however big or digitized, in the long term can do it alone. So we have to collaborate to create nodes of excellence so that data, expertise, everything is shared. So we lift up everybody and not just select the parts of the world. I want to sort of have lost a slide there. Could we go on to the next slide? That, that's it. I will finish off with another painting. I started off with a painting. I'll finish off with this painting. This painting is called The Healing of a Paralytic. Okay? Uh, there are two problems here. And the first problem is very obvious, that access was a problem. They had to open up uh, the roof of the house to bring the patient in. 2,000 years on, access is still a problem. 2,000 years on, this man, by the accounts in the Bible, picked up his mat and walked home. 2,000 years on, no paralytic has ever walked home independently. That's a problem that we face. The barriers today are financial, lack of universal coverage, and access to health care close to where people live. However, the highlight of the painting is not the broken roof. It is the eyes of Jesus that looks into this patient's eyes. Today, we as physicians 
We look into our screens. We don't look at the patient. We look into the screens. And we have lost the art of empathy and touch, which are powerful tools in actual healing. And let us finally remind ourselves of the mission and the vision of our two organizations. And contrary to the popular belief, contrary to the popular belief that mission hospitals exist only to serve the poor, I tell you the mission hospitals exist to serve the top of the pyramid and the bottom of the pyramid, not just exclusive. And so, I have again, oh, no, hold on, hold on. This is my last slide. I will end with this slide, that the story is never written, the script is never completed. The next act is just beginning. CMC Velo, AMH, and all of the missions hospitals around the world are just going to write a new chapter. The only thing is the players in this play are going to be different. It's not going to be Dr. Vikram, it's not going to be me, there are going to be different players. And uh, all I can say is, as long as we kept keep our focus on what we are called upon this earth to do, then institutions like CMC and AMH will always find a place and purpose in God's greater story. So thank you for listening, and may God continue to, to bless you at this institution in how you live out your mission and vision. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Respected chief guest, dignitaries on the stage and off the stage, faculty, staff, students. It's my privilege to stand here today on behalf of the students and staff of Christian Medical College to propose a word of thanks and acknowledge all those who have made this 12th Ida Skada oration possible. As it says in Colossians 3 7, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of Je Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I am thankful to the Lord Almighty for ena enabling us as an institution to conduct the Ida Skada orations regularly, thereby giving us an opportunity to hear, uh, to hear from pioneers from different walks of life and their contributions to the development of the community around them. Our sincere gratitude today goes to Dr. George Arian for kindly accepting our invitations and uh, as a chief guest and delivering the 12th annual Ida Skada oration your oration, particularly your thoughts on mission service and the comparison between the two institutions was truly enriching and inspiring. I request um, Mrs. Deepa to hand over the memento as a token of our gratitude to um, Dr. Cherian. Thank you. We would also like to extend our sincere thanks to Dr. Dali Cherian for accompanying Dr. George Cherian today and being a part of this program and uh, being with us. Ma'am, we really appreciate your presence with us today. I would like to extend a special thanks to the Oration Committee, the Board of Directors of Velo CMC Foundation, joining us virtually. Your contribution to this event and your commitment to the betterment of our institute are deeply appreciated. We would also like to express our sincere gratitude to Ms. Deepa Srivastava, Director of the Church Relations, and uh, Usha Jesudasan, member of the Velo CMC Foundation, and a friend of CMC, for your presence here today and your support and uh, your taking part in this oration. I'm truly grateful to Dr. Vikram Matthews, our director, for his guidance and support and especially Shika and her team from the directorate, members from the principal's office for their dedication and meticulous planning that has played a very pivotal role in making this event a success. 
I'd also like to thank my colleagues for their active participation today. Dr. Betty Simon, our program host, and Dr. Dolly Daniel for introducing the chief guest. And likewise, I would like to thank all the faculty from various departments who hosted our guests for the past couple of days and showed them around the institution. I want to acknowledge the visitors from different parts of the country as well as abroad, and especially those who are listening from Bahrain, our alumni, students, retired staff, and all those who have joined online, and especially all of you for being part of this oration today and taking the time off to be with us today. I uh, thank you once again. And uh, before uh, we finish, I'd like all of you to stand and uh, for the Vesper by the choir, followed by the National Anthem. Thank you.